Hi and welcome. Um, we have heard a lot about different approaches here today. Uh, a lot of information. We have heard about the method wars. We have heard about the Game of Thrones. We have heard about uh, Genefin and the uh, uh, complexity here now. Very interesting topics. And uh, I would like to look at a different thing here. I will be doing this from a safe perspective, but this is not limited to safe and because it's information. When we talk about refining a system, when we talk about growing a system from one version to another in an agile way, we talk about information being refined. We talk about people in different roles, in different parts of the organization, needing to collaborate and cooperate and understand each other, even though they might not be talking and speaking the same language. And here comes information into the place. So I will be talking about information and putting it into a safe context. And for doing that, I need to be here. And for that, of course, we thank all the great sponsors that make this possible here today. OK, why are we doing this? Why are we talking about being agile? We have heard here at this quite good comment now, why should, why should we go to Agile and why don't we look back at what we have done well? Which is a very, very valid point. No, we shouldn't forget about that. I mean, there, is a, there is a lot of good practices around that we, that we can base on, that we can base our evolution upon. Is there a question? Oh, no, no, okay. Uh, <coughs> please, if you have any question, feel free to interrupt me. Now, why, why do we talk about Agile? Why do we talk about Lean? Why are we looking at how we improve, how we need to improve? It is because we have some major pain points out in reality. We have an inability to quickly respond, which means that we are usually slow, or we are perceived to being slow out onto the market. We generate an let's call it an unremarkable customer experience very often when we launch a new product. And when I say we, I mean we in the development industry. That means what is produced might or might not be hard to use, but it's not always what the customer really wanted. And it's having unintended consequences. That is, it's broken. So <coughs> how can we try to address these these pain points. There are several things we can do. We have heard about lots of them, but what I'm going to talk a little bit about here is synchronization of the changes and of the improvements that we are making. <coughs> Having an application pipeline that is joined across several functions, across several organizations, across several teams and uh, having customer and delivery analytics, knowing about what we have done, what went well, what went wrong, in order to learn. There are some sub-scenarios here, because usually what happens when you start to work with the software industry, uh, as you probably know, is that uh, something happens. And uh, if this something is not so desirable, what, <coughs> what can you do in order to understand and plan that something is not surprising you? You need to plan and synchronize plans across several levels, because a lot of people, when we talk about Agile, they, say, they think Agile is no planning at all. And that's not really true. You still need to plan, but you need to plan differently and you need to plan on, a, uh, on another level. And this planning has to be in sync with all the new information we produce during development. Because uh, that was said by someone this morning very, very well, we are dealing a lot with uncertainty here. When we start a project, we have a very, very short horizon of certainty. And after that, there comes a big time where we really don't know what will be happening. And that's, that's the truth with which we are there. So keeping plans on different levels in sync is one, one way to address that. And then when we have done some stuff, we need to implement and deploy that stuff. And this implementation and deployment has to be synchronized as well. That has to be going into the same direction. That has to be pulling it all together, keeping dev and ops together. 
if we go back to, uh, to what Scott addressed here this morning as well. Now, I will be addressing a little bit of these two levels in, in this talk today, a little bit. And I will be doing this from a scaling agile perspective. And um, if we talk about scaling agile, we have to look a little bit back about agile. Because what is agile actually doing? If we go back some years, we lived in a world where we and management very often lived in the fantasy world that both content, time, and cost would be fixed. So we lived and planned our projects like we knew two years in advance, this will cost that much, it will contain that and that much, and it will be delivered at that and that day. And we worked as if that was the truth. Now, in all the projects I have been with during that time, I think we never hit once. I don't know if you have different experiences, but that is my experience. We, we were not hitting that mark once. With Agile development, we accept that this is not true, that we need flexibility. And if we look at these parameters that I mentioned, we have cost and we have delivery time. And in an Agile organization, we try to keep those as fixed parameters. We are driving during a development time, during a certain timeline, we are driving at a certain cost. We are keeping the same amount of resources busy. We, we are doing, doing that in a fixed frame. And we are aiming at the fixed delivery time. We are running our sprints with certain cadences, and we know when we will be delivering. But what we don't know is to which level will our features be mature at that point in time. So we have that as a variable that we know a long way ahead. We don't know really how mature these features will be when we release. But we will learn the closer we get to the release date. The more can we specify. Are you with me on this one? Does this ring a bell or do you object? Hmm? This is, I call this a Swedish OK. <coughs> In Sweden, I get as much response. So that's OK. That's good. I'm used to it. So we have the Agile Manifesto when we talk about Agile. Who has read the Agile Manifesto in here? Who remembers it? OK. <laughs> OK, in the, in the Agile Manifesto, we have 12 principles. And they describe quite, very, uh, quite well what should be driving the Agile thinking. What should we focus on? What is important to remember? like delivering working software frequently. And of course, they were formulated from a pure software perspective, and they were formulated from a team perspective the day they were, they were done. But I would like you to take a short discussion with your, with your neighbors very briefly and think a little bit about, OK, if you look very briefly at these, at these principles, do they scale? Are they applicable for a team of teams? Are they applicable for an enterprise? Are they applicable for a non-software production company? I would like to. Uh, I would like you to. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I would like you to. Hmm. 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 I would like you to share a little bit of your thoughts and discuss briefly with each other about that. It's free to talk with each other now. <laughs> okay. Changing those. Collaboration, they are important. But do you see anything here that is obvious, obviously not, not working if you try to scale that? Working softwares. Okay. That's a good point. If we want to scale this, it's, it's not software we're talking about. It's technology, it's business, it's product. It's about what we are developing at the moment. And in the end, it's about are we producing value towards, towards our customers? with working technology, working product, whatever. So that is something that, yeah, if you want to scale it, you, you shouldn't focus on the software part here only. Good comment. Okay, let's continue there. <coughs> so 
if we want to scale this, um, there is always the opportunity to do as we were told here uh, prior to, to lunch. You can start from scratch, looking at how we are doing today, trying to put together um, a process and a workflow and a Kanban board that is optimized to my way of working, to my company, to, to everything that is in there. But you could also be looking at what is happening now, because what we want to achieve in the end is that this is the reality we are facing. We have some teams that might be speeding up. They are getting agile. Maybe they are working in product development. Maybe these guys are working in product management, or they might be working in hardware development, or in technology development, or in mechanical development, or just another part of the, uh, of the system which is based on a legacy system that is hard to release very often. So if we have a situation like this, where we have some teams that are not able to speed up as much as other teams, and we do not plan for this situation, what comes out at the end to the customer? Not very much. What comes out, of course, is a higher job satisfaction. It comes out probably less faults. It comes out higher quality, all that stuff. So that, that is a positive impact, regardless if everyone is drawing in the same direction. But from a pure delivery perspective, this is not giving us any big improvement. So what we want to achieve is rather something like this, where you do synchronized planning across across your business, across your business release, and try to do that planning and the order in which stuff has to be developed so that you, for example, here, can have a release of the Agile team that is still working with the old platform. It has no dependency to what's coming out here. So you can release earlier from here towards an internal or an external customer, and by that way, generate value at the customer at an earlier point in time. If they are so strict that you cannot break the dependency chain, tough luck. Then you can't speed up your delivery, because that's what you're saying as a constraint by saying that. If you have a constraint that says, we can't deliver more often, whatever that constraint may be, and it's unquestionable, then you just said, give it, gave the answer. It's not possible. But I assume that in most industries, this is possible. You have product versions, you have a platform, and you can decouple some functionality from the, old, from the new platform and deliver it to the old platform. In a lot of companies, you can be doing that. You can be at least doing internal deliveries to run verification and test cycles much, much earlier, integration cycles much, much earlier. So I'm positive that in a lot of companies, you can do this kind of improvement regardless of what kind of technology you are developing up here. And <coughs> we're currently running this kind, this kind of uh, projects to identify this stuff with a number of um, companies that have, that have both hardware, mechanical, and firmware development as well. So you can find and improve in that area. So this is, let's assume that this is where you want to go and where you have the possibility to go. Of course, if you want to do this, you need management and support, you need a lot of stuff in place. But if you have that, you want to scale. And if you scale, you want to communicate. You want to have one language. And one thing is to, to use a blank piece of paper and doing this that yourself. The other is to go to one of the f available frameworks. And now I'm basing this on SAFE, which does not mean that I'm saying that SAFE is the only solution. SAFE is one framework that provides a common language across different parts of the business where you can communicate about what you are doing and explain why you are doing certain things in a certain way. The AD offers the same kind of language framework, with different words, of course, but also language framework. Other frameworks do that as well. So this is an example why I'm using SAFE here for this talk. What is, <coughs> what is important here in SAFE, from, from my perspective now, is that SAFE helps you in and puts a lot of focus in the synchronization of the alignment when you deliver and on the collaboration between 
different teams when you have a large number of teams collaborating with each other. These are my two key points here from, from Save Why I Like It So Much. You have here <coughs> development, for example, going on in Scrum with a certain cadence, but up here on the program level, you have a macro cadence. You have another cadence which is a multiplication of the cadence you have on the lowest level. So this makes synchronization between teams that need to go with different speeds much easier. We will look a little bit more at that very soon. So at the core, at, at the bottom of SAFE, there is the Agile team. And that is very often forgotten that if you come in with a framework like SAFE, you just assume this is working because it's about scaling Agile. It's not about introducing Agile. And that's where a lot of the criticism against SAFE is correct. Because if you introduce SAFE as a framework for introducing Agile into your company, there is a high risk that you will fail. Because that's not what it was intended for. SAFE in assumes that you have Agile in place on the team level, on the development level, that you already managed to do this then you will be able to scale from there. And SAFE helps you with that. On the program level, you really try to get your product sprinting, not your team's sprinting. You want to introduce the same kind of practices, the same kind of rituals, but on a higher level. So for example, you have, if you follow the suggested frame of SAFE, you have about every 10 weeks a two-day planning event where a complete release train that is up to 150 people, all the teams working in one value stream, come together for two full days, doing dependency analysis and resolution and planning for the next five sprints. Now, if you think about Scrum and XP on the team level, this is about the same that the teams do every two weeks when they do their sprint planning. Just on a higher scale, and you need more time for that because you have to give the opportunity to all the teams to talk to each other, to understand each other, and to re resolve the conflicts and dependencies that they discover. So what, <coughs> what Scaling Agile is about in the end is getting your product sprinting, not getting the team sprinting, because just having a team sprinting and producing code faster, having no DevOps, having no Agile product management, how much is coming out at the customer? Not very much. It's when you get all those together, if what the teams are producing is quicker on the way out to the customer and is handled with Agile prioritization and Agile product management, that's when you start to get your product sprinting. But that means also you have more communication overhead. Because if you want to have the teams being able to make tough decisions about prioritization, if you want to have the teams being able to do planning without hindering other teams, they have to know what they are doing. And you can't do that without communication. And that is very often forgotten, that you say, yeah, yeah, these scrum meetings we need to have, but do we really have to have these big planning events? Yes, you do. If you don't talk to each other, you don't understand, to it. You don't understand each other, you won't become a big team sprinting a product. On the portfolio level, when you want to scale it even to that level, we're talking about getting a complete corporation sprinting and getting principles from Agile and Lean into a complete corporation, building on <coughs> principles from Lean and Kanban very much, not so much from Agile because it's very hard to get the purely Agile XP stuff scaled even up to, to portfolio management. That is hard. So there, there SAFE relies very much on Lean and Kanban principles. Let's take very few of them, of what we are talking about here, a little bit more in detail, just, just three of them. One of the, of the core elements is develop on cadence. I already mentioned that. You have, <coughs> you have a cadence of development where you have your sprints, where you always know what's happening. If you have worked with Scrum, you know how important that is, that you have always the same things happening. And you do this on the product level. But that does not mean that the product 
does necessarily release only at these points. So you develop a cadence, but you release on demand. You release on when there is a business need for a release, not because the calendar is telling you so. So that is one important principle. The next one is alignment. Alignment is very important if we want to scale Agile, because Agile builds very, very much on trust. You need to trust each other on the same level. You need to trust your peers. Development teams need to trust their product managers to coming with the right information and giving them access to the right information to being able to make the tough decisions. And at the same time, management has to trust the Agile teams to do the right thing, because otherwise we will be back in command and control. And that is one rightful criticism against SAFE there, that if abused, this structure with different levels and breakdowns makes it easier to cling to command and control and believe you are doing Agile, even though you're not. And that is rightful, that criticism. But that's not the intention of SAFE, even though it can be abused, as many things can. So, alignment is a very important point here. And the third one is transparency because that's also built, uh, adding towards the trust. You need to see from management level what's happening at the bottom in order to being able to trust, not to control, but rather to see how is my part of the system sprinting? How is my part, what I'm responsible for doing? Just because I'm giving content authority and decision authority towards development teams does not mean that I abandon my authority around the business decisions. I have to see how is my business decision progressing. I'm funding a, a huge project and I want to know what's happening in there. There is nothing wrong with that. Okay, for all these kind of things, alignment and transparency, we need to have information. We have to need have the same language and we need to look at what it is we are dealing with. And the information nexus for that in a safe perspective, is happening very much around the program level. That's where the information, both from the portfolio level and the team level, accumulate. That's where they get together. <coughs> what are then the main information carriers from a planning perspective? We have business epics in SAFE, where you do the business planning on the highest level. On the program level, we have program epics that are local to one program, but that can span several releases, and we have features. And the features are planned roughly into an agile release train that has a cadence on program increments. Usually you don't plan these features ahead more than one or two coming increments, but you indicate where you are going. And then of course you have to have an overall vision where you are going, etc. That's more fluffy. It's harder to track what's happening with that vision. And then down on the sprint level, <coughs> on the team level, you have, of course, mainly the stories. You have, of course, de defects, tasks, etc. But these are the main planning elements. Then you have other information you probably want to track, like how is my system faring, uh, what are critical system areas that we are working with, etc. But from a breakdown and planning perspective, these are the main ones. Now. To make the life a little bit more complex or complicated, depending on how you see these two uh, <coughs> terms, where we got a good introduction previously, we have them organized in several backlogs. We have portfolio backlogs covering the business epics. We have epic backlog and program backlog on the program level. And we have team backlogs with stories and defects and other stuff they need to do on the team level. So we have several backlogs on several levels, and they are connected with each other by nature. If you are working with Scrum already today, you probably get some list of features that program management wants to, wa wants to have implemented, or product management, and you break it down into stories. But do you get the information about how is that connected to your business objectives and to your business priorities? How is that in your life? Do you get a visibility from your stories towards the business planning. Would that help when you make decisions about priorities down in the team? Let's look a little bit at that later. So <coughs> we also introduce here one additional term which is called work package. I won't in this talk talk too much about that, but this is a planning item for planning on the collaboration level between teams and focusing on integration 
where uh, one team can implement a work package in one sprint, and that makes co um, dependency resolution a bit easier than just breaking down from feature directly to sprint, but that is a different discussion. So you do a breakdown from epics down to stories across several levels. Depending on your way of working, you will have different information elements, but what you in fact are doing is you have some business planning and you break it down, you refine that to a lower level. And then you have to update it upwards. And usually, in most companies, it's like, okay, here we have some portfolio planning in Excel. That's a tool of choice in many companies for doing this kind of stuff. You do some feature planning, maybe in Excel, maybe in the requirement management system, whatever. And at the end, the team works in one sprint planning system, like JIRA, Rational Team Concert, whatever on that level, or with yellow stickers. Could also be. Um, if the company has distributed teams, there is a good chance that the teams on the lowest level will work with several tools, or if they are using the several tools, that they are configured in several ways. So you, you are not using the same state machine, for example. You have a different Kanban mapping on the lowest level. Does that sound familiar? Any one of you working with distributed teams? Are you working with the same process across the teams? No. Nope. You neither. That's the reality we have faced. So what we think about is, OK, let the teams work in what works best for them. They need to optimize the process for their performance, for being as productive as possible. The same actually is true for business management and for product management. Why should you enforce the same process across everything? That's not really necessary. But you need to have the same language. You have to be able to talk about the same kind of information elements on the different levels. So if you have, for example, on the highest level, the business planning with the epics, you could, instead of only showing a Kanban board, you could be showing some kind of progress bar in here as well, showing, <coughs> showing that this epic is progressing towards the next level in your Kanban board. With this kind of information, you can break down and drill down into the next level, the feature planning, where you see that your features are also progressing towards the next level. And the stories, or in this example, the work packages on the next level are the lowest planning element in this example. So if now the teams use their tool of choice and update their status from in progress to work to implement it down there, the elements above need to be moved as well if they have progress due to that. And in most companies, that's done in status meetings. You sit together, how is this doing? How is this feature progressing? How is your project doing? You collect that kind of information. Or you send around large Excel, uh, around large Excel sheets that need to be updated. But since in many companies, the lowest level is already addressed in a system like JIRA, you can harvest that information and you can, buy, can combine that in another system that analyzes that, uh, that information and brings it upward. You can do this kind of stuff yourself with um, some programming, with some Excel, maybe adapting some existing tools with plugins. Yeah, <coughs> uh, We have a solution on our own, my company, that does this. So these are screenshots from, from our tool. And of course, I have to mention that as well. Um, <coughs> and you can collect that information from several sources. And why do you want to do this? this is, uh, these are screenshots from, uh, from uh, the progress of some of my teams that are working in my company. And these are from last week. So what I see here is that on the left side of this green bar is historical data, and on the right side of the green bar of today, that's planned data. And what I saw there was down here, <coughs> that during the last sprints, not once have the teams closed all stories at the sprint border. They have had spillover between the sprints in the way we are working. We have actually, during discussions, changed our definition of done. So that we now say that a work item is done only if the stakeholder has accepted it, has agreed to it. And that is usually done during the sprint demo. So, previously, there was a, 
a different definition of done. But what's happening now is that development is putting the element into implemented, and that means it's tested as well. Um, <coughs> And then nothing happens, because uh, that is not clear to the, the, to the stakeholders that now they should be getting active. Actually, what's happening here in this Kanban board, elements and implemented, that's the, that's the place where I, as a stakeholder, should be doing a pull and say, okay, here is a feature or a work package or whatever that I'm responsible for, which I should acknowledge, which I should say, okay, this is implemented and works as I desired. But I wait, since I don't know that, for for this to go into done and being uh, to to go into the sprint demo, and then I see how it's working. I'm discussing with the with the devs who have done that, and there's each and every one sprint. There is some work that the t the stakeholder is not satisfied with, and which maybe has been lying there for a week or one and a half even. So long feedback cycle unnecessary. So what we are doing now is we wa we are doing a new state in between here, verified after implemented, to indicate it's not only implemented, it's verified, and to make clear that verified is owned by the stakeholders, and that's from there where they should be looking several times during a sprint and give their okay or not okay towards the teams. We wouldn't have seen that if we would not have combined the information from several tools and the information from teams at different locations into one and the same system so that we can see how is the complete product progressing and running. This is just a short example from, re from my daily life where this kind of systems help. It's not that I say you should be using systems because I like systems, it's really because they solve some problems. Okay, another problem they are solving is they help you with consistent prioritization. And Don Reynardson, who has already been mentioned today, he has uh, written in his, in his book, um, <coughs> Principles of Product Development Flow, that uh, you have to take an economic view on whatever you do. And that means you have to come up with an economic system that reflects your economic view. So you have several variables you could be looking at, or you could follow suggestions from him about looking at something called wait as short as job first to simplify that where you do your prioritization by calculating something called the cost of delay that is an important measurement that you should know about when a feature is coming late what is the cost of delay that's the most important economic factor actually if you want to prioritize it's not about what is the business value of that no but what would it cost our company if it comes later because then you can think about, okay, if we combine the cost of delay with development dur uh, duration, we can actually do a variable calculation based on cost of delay divided by duration. This could be our priority. Because the quicker something reaches the customer relatively to, to its value, the better for the most companies. Now, <coughs> now I don't go into detail here, but this, this is quite a complex formula. Suggesti a suggestion there from SAFE is that you could split it up into additional values, still quite complicated. But then they made some practical tests um, doing, doing a comparison between having absolute values here for user business value, time criticality, risk reduction, opportunity enablement value, that something is worth $200,000, something is $500,000 or using a relatively Fibonacci uh, scale, the same one that you use for your story points for ranking. Because it does not, it's not important, is this worth one million or five million dollars? It's important, it's twice as valuable as the other stuff. That's what you want to add. And everything else is anyhow guesstimates. You're just guessing what the value would be. But you have probably quite good gut feeling about this is twice or three or five times as big or as valuable as the other thing. So this simplifies this quite a lot. And if you do this simplification, you can do this ranking, this prioritization, quite easily by doing, by providing in Excel, in our tool, probably in configurations of other tools as well, support for that, where you <coughs> where just do a stacked ranking and use the relative Fibonacci scale accordingly. So that means you just say, okay, this is more valuable than that one. This is more valuable than that one etc. And then the, the relative values are assigned accordingly, automatically. So that if you, 
if you shift the position of one element in the duration column, the ranking, the result, will change. If you shift something in the user value column, the ranking will change. If you then have this kind of ranking available, that gives you the possibility to find prioritization and planning conflicts, if you have that information available in the system. We, for example, can say that if you're planning conflicts with the prioritization, everyone involved will get a warning. So this is a possibility you have that you can, can work with if you handle information consistently, even though you can still have various tools depending, and depending on the need and optimized for the need in the different parts of the organization. You can still, if you agree on one minimum basic information model that is as simple as possible, you can still combine quite a lot of that information. And that is basically what I wanted to talk about. The keywords are up there, cadence, alignment, and transparency. These are the main keywords for achieving information consistency and for, <coughs> for scaling agile. So thank you for your time, and are there any questions? <laughs> yeah, we are, we are doing this ourselves, and we are helping other companies to implement this as well. This is this is from the Praxis. Yeah. Erica, well, thank you. Thank you, Farish. Token of appreciation for you coming. Thank here. you. Uh, you didn't see this, but hopefully tonight we'll actually go and see this in person. Looking it's forward to that. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks to you. We have a